Is leaving MLS and going abroad the right move for every single American player? Is it different for each player? Also, it's not just about going, it's when you go, where you go, there's a lot that goes into it. Today we have Breck Shea here at the channel to talk about his experience when he moved from Dallas to Stoke and reflect on what was done right, what was done wrong, was it the right move, and what advice would he give to young American players that choose to challenge themselves abroad? In a very honest and open conversation, it was great. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV, and welcome to episode two of this two-episode mini-series that we have with Breck Shea here at the channel. This is how it's going to go. So as I said, this is part two. Part one has already been released, so you can go check that out yourself. It was a bit more personal about Breck Shea. Today, we're going to dive into whether or not going abroad is always the right move, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're also going to be talking about Breck Shea's return to MLS a few years ago. Obviously, he's retired by now. We're going to talk about when he played for Orlando City, Atlanta, Inter Miami, Lionel Messi, and much more. Oh, and Orlando City fans, Breck Shea has a great message for you at the end of the video, so you might want to stick around for that, if you want to. I also said this at part one, and I'll say it here again. My goal is to become best friends with Breck Shea by the end of this episode. Will I become best friends with him this episode? Well, stick around and you might find out. But before we start, I totally forgot. Make sure to drop a like in this video. I won't be asking during the interview, and hitting the like button is free. At worst, you might get some cramping on your finger because it is a lot of work, but it's free, and free is good. And maybe I'll give you like a virtual hug. Do you want a hug? I'll give you a hug if you drop the like right now. Okay, let's bring in Breck Shea. Okay, everyone, welcome to part two here with Breck Shea. Uh, part one was, fa was fun. We talked a little bit less about soccer. Now this one, it's going to be pretty much just soccer on part two. We're going to talk about his experience abroad. We're going to talk about his time at Stoke. Major League Soccer, Messi and MLS, and much more. Breck, how are we doing? Even though you never really left, we're recording at the same one. <laughs> I'm doing good. Just as good as earlier. It's just as good as like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Breck, let's talk about your time at Stoke, heading abroad. Uh, you had your time at FC Dallas. I think many people don't even remember this, but I think you got an opportunity at Dallas replacing Jesus Ferreira's dad. Wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, pl I, I I don't remember specifically, but I played with his dad for many years. So um, I think you're the first few opportunities. Like he got injured, then they started to play something like I, that. I remember my first. It wasn't my first game, but at my first start, I, I was going at Shellis Heinemann. I was like, "Hey, I need to play. I need to." Play. I was a cocky young kid. I don't remember how old I was in my teens. And I was just like, dude, I need to play. I, I deserve to play. I'm killing people in training. Let me play. And finally, uh, I think specifically it was Jeff Cunningham got hurt in warm up on a game. So he's like, hey, you're going to play up front. So I was like, all right. And we're playing San Jose and I scored two goals. It was player of the week. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, just, I mean, I look back on it, but like, that's what I had to do. But I was like, I remember being in Chelsea's ear, like, I need to play. Like, put me in. Doesn't it and feel I backed like, it up. But doesn't it feel like as a soccer player, you can give your perspective on this before we talk about Stoke, don't you need to be a little bit cocky or a little bit arrogant? Otherwise, you don't believe in yourself. And how does that work? You need to be a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, I've seen it go both ways where people are arrogant and it's a downfall. And, and I see it the other way where they're arrogant and you look at like it's Latin, you know, like uh, not to put him, he's hard to compare, but um, it works both ways. So I, I think, I mean, just on that note, like I see too many young kids these days being arrogant and cocky who haven't done anything and, and they fall through the cracks. And some of these guys mm -hmm. that I know are, are, I mean, where they're at at 16, 17 is 10 times where I was at. And I'm like, you guys, you got to get it together here, you know? And and they just, you know, their kids are too worried about social media and likes, you know? They, Dion said it the other day, we have too many cats. We need dogs, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote. And, and, I love that quote. And you, you yourself, you talked about it to, with me that uh, not YouTube. You said you like listening to podcasts, videos, but you're not into uh, social media that much. Like you said, like Twitter, Instagram, those you're not yeah. into very much. Um, no, I, I mean, I, just like anyone else, I like scrolling and looking at a few things here and there. But I, 
I don't want to be in my house looking like this and my kids are looking at me, looking at my phone. So then now my kids are going to, when they're older, they're going to want to be looking at their phones like this. But I don't know. I just, I, I, I'm real nervous for, for my kids. So then I try to keep myself away from it. But uh, definitely, like just like anyone else, I, I enjoy scrolling. Especially Twitter now is my favorite because the drama going on and you can go down these rabbit holes. So yeah, I, I got to gotta, like set a timer. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you don't follow me on Twitter, though. I hope so. It, it gets it's it gets nasty with um, U.S. men's national team fan. But even though to a certain extent, I'd say USMNT Twitter has been behaving a bit better lately. I think that's good. Or maybe I got used I, to it. I, yeah, I, well, I'm sure there's a lot to talk about <laughs> right now <laughs> or in the past few months. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. A, I would say from January or right after the World Cup. From now, exactly. a lot has happened. Yeah, um, a lot has happened. Uh, but we're not going to dive into that right now or even dive into it at all in this video unless you want to talk about it at some point. But let's talk, about, right. you. <laughs> let's talk about you. Let's talk about you. You went to Stoke after being successful with, with FC Dallas. The first question I want to ask you before you talk about what you think went right, what went wrong, what could have been done better. Did Jurgen Klinsmann play a role on you going abroad at that moment? Did he, I wouldn't say pressure you, but push you? Because he's always been that way in terms of players. Go abroad, go abroad. We talked about that with Jeff Cameron. And Cameron said he thought that was even a positive. He thought he liked the fact that he was pushing players to do that. Did he have any influence on your move? Yeah. I mean, Klinsman believed in me. And, I mean, he he brought me in for uh, most of my U.S. Men's National Team career. And he – he got a lot of stick at that time. I'm just going to talk about him a little bit because he was very different than the the group that was before him and after him. And he, he, in my eyes at the time, I used to fight some of the stuff we did, but he was so big on nutrition and fitness and sleeping right. And all these things that we know now, like, I mean, we knew then, but like differently now, like he was ahead of his time in my eyes, like what, what people are doing now, just starting to like believe in the last few years he was doing you know, 10 years ago. And it was new at that time, I feel like. And and I, I really have big appreciation for him and, and, and that. And I know he got a lot of stick. And like, for instance, like he wanted to play the best teams in the world. He wanted to play Germany, Spain, um, France every week. Like that's the teams he wanted to play. We played a lot of big games. And, you know, like, I mean, no offense, but the last two games, last – the two lead up for the World Cup for the U.S. Men's National Team, the two games they just played, it was it Uzbekistan? I'm like, like yeah. what are you doing out of that? Like, what, how does that help us at all? Like, yeah, I, again, Berhalter, I don't want to dive in right right yeah, now, but Berhalter, it doesn't. It doesn't do Klinsman anything. Wants to play Germany, all that. Well, to be fair, we're gonna play Germany next month, but Berhalter likes to play Oman and Uzbekistan, and he likes to play Caribbean islands too. He has fun with yeah. those, uh, which you see how the game goes. But yes, of course, I, I'm all for that. We we should be playing. We should be playing Germany. We should be playing Brazil, Argentina, Japan. Japan's very good right now. Uh, instead of countries like Oman and Uzbekistan that never even played a World Cup. We're trying to do something yeah. in the World Cup. So play teams that are in the World Cup. I guess we finally get that against Germany and Ghana. But I agree with you. The September camp felt like a, a waste. But back to you with Klinsman. No, that was good. Uh, sorry. Um, again, I just thought he was ahead of his time. And I appreciated him. And um, obviously, everyone has their, their quirks. But... Uh, and he had a few, but, um, and again, nothing against Burhalter. Uh, I, I don't know him personally um, as a coach, but I heard he's very detailed and, and, and good at his job. So um, I'm excited to see them play Germany and, and Ghana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have some doubts of him being good on his job, but that's me, not Brick. That's, that's my opinion, even <laughs> though people know this by now. But going back to you, so now we go to your move to Stoke City. Uh, go Looking at, obviously now it's easier to just look back at it and then say, oh, this was right, this was wrong. At the time, it's a lot harder to make a decision because you don't know what the outcome will be of every single decision you make. Every time we look back in life, it's a lot easier. Oh, I should have done this better or that. But at the same time, you learned a lot from whatever you did right, whatever you did wrong. Do you think you made the move at the right time? Uh, should you have stayed maybe with Dallas or in Major League Soccer longer? What is your overall perspective looking back now? What was done right? What was done wrong? Would you have done anything differently? Uh, things like that. Um, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but the the worst part was when I was leaving Dallas that offseason, I had two surgeries. One surgery 
that I never came back from fully. Um, I had a bone removed from my toe and I, I it just never was the same. And because of that injury, I was running funny and had a, a, a groin surgery. So I had two surgeries in December and then I go to Stoke in January. So when I, when I showed up there, I'm having to rehab for the first three months. And so that's never a good sign of showing up to a team after just having two surgeries. And so that, I mean, the timing for that was, I mean, horrible, pretty much. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, it, so leading up, like I had a lot of offers um, in 2011 and um, from a lot of big teams and a lot of, uh, and the MLS just wanted so much money. So I think I was just so fed up with being there that I, I just told Don, like, I was like, look, I, I want to go explore my options. I want to try it and play in Europe. And, and they were making it so hard and asking ridiculous <laughs> price tag on my head and so i was just got turned down turned down turned down so finally i i think when it just came i didn't know anything about it stoke you know and the way they played and then tony pulis and i just was like yeah so she gave me like i just want to go like I, at that point i was just like a everything was blurry and i and i went to a team in stoke that was uh not my style or anything like that like uh <laughs> a lot, i know, just play a lot of kickballs what i called it but um, old again, English playing style. Exactly. And, and yeah. it, it was a, it was a shock for me, but, um, at the same time, I, I, I can't really change that. I, I, I learned a lot. I became a better person. I think a better player. And I experienced something as a kid that I watched, I was watching the EPL and, and got to go there. You know what I mean? Like that, not many people can say that. Um, did I do what I wanted to do there? No, not at all. But, um, I'm grateful for the experience and people I met and players I got to play with and against and coaches that um, whether I liked them or not, like, you know, it all shaped me to be who I am. So uh, it's bittersweet, but um, again, I'm, I'm thankful for it all. Would you say a move abroad helps a player? Because one thing I, I moved a lot in my life, I've lived in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, California, um, New York, a couple months in Texas and a lot of years here in Florida too, most in the United States, but almost half in Brazil and half here. And one thing I noticed is every time I moved, uh, I would mature far faster. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, just being in a different environment, not knowing anyone, it almost feels like you don't have an option. Do you think that helped you mature that move regardless of whatever was negative about it? Yeah. I mean, for, uh, like I'm just, uh, very friendly, um, happy all the time. Grew up in the state of Texas, sunshine at all times. And I go to England where you don't see the sun for six months at a time, you know? Like just that alone took a toll. I just I just didn't think about that. And being freezing every day and being alone. Like I went from living with my brother and my friend and my agent in Dallas to being by myself in England. And then obviously I had Jeff Cameron and, and Marisa do, but good buddies of mine. But I just mentally wasn't ready to maybe I wasn't ready it was I, I didn't prepare myself for that you know and I went there and, and you go to a new MLS team and people are friendly like first day hi how are you doing blah 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 they want to know you they get to help you out like do you need help in England I mean I'd say 70% of the team didn't talk to me for a month didn't say anything to me not not a word because they look at it I'm there to take their job you know and mm -hmm. fair enough and that's just I, I had no idea, you know, I, I'm coming in like, all right, these, these guys are like shit talking me and I haven't even been here a day. I'm just playing soccer. This is what I want to do. Like, this is what I thought we all want to do. Uh, what I was saying was uh, it's a different culture, right? Because in the U.S., um, it's we have a different sports culture than Europe, South America in general. And when it comes to soccer, it's even more different. And that's probably part of what you dealt with. It, it's a culture shock. That's probably what you dealt yes. with. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh I, again if, if i would have i just for my advice for kids is, is it's it's not pretty you see it on tv you hear the fans and those fans do more shit talking than they do cheering so you got to perform week in week out and and if you are they're great if, the second you do something bad they're they're on top of you yeah <laughs> hey but you're getting paid you're getting paid for that there's no there's no big deal you're getting paid to to, to play so the fans want to see stuff yeah, it's, it's part of sports, right? At the end of the day, fans are like, if you're winning, you're the best player in the world. If you're losing, you're crap. You're horrible. You shouldn't be there. Yeah. That's how fandom is. And obviously, when you go towards that, there are reasonable fans. 
they're crazy fans. They're passionate fans. Um, and the same thing goes to media and analysts. There's analysts that are more reasonable and they try to understand situation. There, there are analysts that are just like go at you when you're playing like crap or and overly praise you when you're playing well. It's just part of the business. Now, what I'm getting from your story a little bit is would you you would say that maybe because you wanted to go to Europe so bad, you wanted to explore different options and you had some good offers rejected previously, you almost um accepted and and look these are my words okay I'm, I'm not putting words into your mouth so you can even tell me if i'm wrong you almost accepted stoke out of impulse a little bit because it was like you were younger obviously you wanted to explore those options and it's like you were fed up that's something where you said you're like all right it's here i'm going and then you like you said the style of play didn't suit you the injury obviously didn't help um and i i talked to some players in the current u.s men's national team setup more specifically i talked to dest uh, Serginho Dest in person once um, and he mentioned how his move to AC Milan it was a mistake because he wasn't fully aware of their roster how they played and everything how he would fit and that the player that was a right back the, was the captain his the guy that played yeah. his position was Italian and the captain so I guess like right there is also a mistake of a move would you say to players I guess um be patient but for how long that's the other question because you also want to move early so you can develop earlier instead of moving when you're 28. Yeah, what, what it's a it's, that it's, line? I, I, I think everyone's different. And I think if you can get there at a, at a young age and, and get accumulated and get used to the environment and understand the situation and then learn, I think that's worth it. And I think making a move um, without knowing <laughs> or doing any research or having any idea what you're getting into, that's different. Um, but then a 28 year old who's been playing, he's got 300 games under his belt in MLS and then go somewhere and could have a good four or five years. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, um, look at like a guy like Darlington Nagby could have went at, at any time in his career. He could probably still go. And he chooses not to, but he he's a player that could have went at 28. He could have went at 21. He could probably go at 31. You know, like he, he's a good player. And I think he uh, it would have worked out for him. But break. So I, I think question. everyone's different. I have a question for you right there. You're yeah. not in the Alexi Lala's bandwagon that he said that, well, no one's in that bandwagon, I think. They said Darlington Nagby could play for any club in the world. I, I agree that he can. He could have played in any league. I think he could have gone to top leagues. Uh, any club is a bit of a stretch, like a Manchester City? I mean, I think I think you could play in Manchester City. I can't. I can't. I'm definitely. telling you right now. Look, the, <laughs> I definitely can't. It, like, I don't mean it like that. I'm saying like, a better Unless team, you have like a Manchester a City player, pickup team, pickup team like you could. Player. I'm saying like a team like Man City, who's so good and so dominant that you you put one person in there, especially in his position. I mean, all he's doing is playing right here. You know, it's simple. He's got to kill the pass and it's fine. Why? Why do you think? Because you mentioned Darlington Nagby, and then there's players also like Lyndon Donovan too. That one can say that maybe he never challenged his potential to the fullest because he. Definitely could have played in the best leagues of Europe, the best teams. Uh, Darlington Nagby could have Darlington Nagby could have also gone to the top leagues. And usually the players achieve their maximum potential by challenging themselves as much as possible. Uh, do you know why they didn't do it? Do you, do you have a theory? Have you talked to them about it? I mean, everyone's different. Everyone has different goals. Everyone has um, different places they are in their life, whether it's family or friends or, I mean, maybe... <laughs> I don't know, but it's 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 not all roses on the other side. I'll tell you that. So I mean, it, it's a grind. So I don't want to speak for people, but maybe that just wasn't for them. I mean, you can walk into a locker room and there's a dead pig right there. That happened yeah. to you. <laughs> That's definitely not a a fun experience. Uh, the reason I I even asked you about this is because I'm I'm going to give an example of a son of a former teammate of yours, um, Ferreira and Jesus Ferreira. Uh, there's often talks about how uh, he's doing very well in Major League Soccer. Then he goes to the national team, doesn't really meet expectations, and he's still young enough that we keep saying maybe he should go to Europe and challenge himself, and and maybe that will get him to develop more. Do you think there's a certain age where if you go to Europe, you or not? Well, Europe is a, I guess that's a stupid way to put it from my end because Europe is very big. I mean, top leagues in Europe, right? There's no yes. point on leaving MLS and going to play in San Marino. No offense to the San Marino league. And there's leagues, multiple leagues in Europe that are far worse than Major League Soccer these days. Do you think there's a certain age where when you go 
it's a bit too late to develop or because we've seen this with players, right? Like 28, 29, 30, that's usually peak years for players. They're usually at their peak of development physically, mentally, everything. Do you think there's a moment that it might be too late? Because I think it is true that there is a moment, but I want to hear from you, an actual player, because Tim Ream just kind of shut everyone's mouth, right? Out of nowhere, the guy peaked at age 36. Uh, yeah. But in general, do you think there's an age that you're like, okay, at this age, the guy might not see that big of a jump in terms of development? I think it's all an experience. If you have an 18-year-old kid that's played 100 games for his club, like he's got great experience and he's obviously doing something right. You know? Or you have a... I mean, in America, we have kids that first year, they're 24 years old. Maybe they went to school and, and whatnot, you know, and obviously they're, they're behind, but like their body is still, they don't have that the amount of games underneath them. So they're still good for a long time. I mean, you look at Jeff and started later and played a lot longer, you know, um, but back on Tim Ream, I, I think, uh, I think it's awesome what he's doing. I, I'm really enjoying it, um, watching him play and I, I hope he goes until he's 40. I mean, what's to stop him, you know? I, I haven't talked to him recently about it, but it's really cool to see. Um, and then back on um, Jesus Ferreira, I mean, I, I, I love watching that kid play. Uh, he's he's uh, he's dynamic. He's He can play the pass. He can dribble. He can score. Um, he's exciting. And I, I think he, my personal opinion is he wants to win. And he, he wants to win, whether it's to go somewhere to compete I just don't – I think Dallas is complacent with just being mediocre. Um, and that's an old club of mine, and I, I love Dallas. And But the, the kid wants to win. And, and, and if you're not going to bring people in to help him or, or challenge or uh, whatnot, then, then you, they should let him go to, to fulfill it. Whether he enjoys the other side or not, that's up to him to decide. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Very often people will call me a Jesus Ferreira hater. Uh, but the thing is, for me, is I think he's done enough in MLS that it's time for him to go somewhere where it'll be a bit more challenging. And if he fails, it's fine. He tried. He can always come back here and he's proven he can perform here. Um, I just think that that's the way to unlock his potential. And what is his potential? I don't know. No one knows. You can only know by doing it. I just don't. I, I just hope he takes that next step. But again, we don't know what Dallas is holding. Like you said, they might be asking for too much money and the guy can't go. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of that into it. But let's talk about MLS. We're talking about MLS. Let's talk about MLS. Ended your career in Europe, came back to Orlando City. Uh, it was an expansion. For, it was the first season. Yeah, I believe the coach was yeah. Jason Christ. Adrian uh, Heath. Adrian Heath. Jason Christ came after, yeah. Jason Christ. I have beef with Jason Christ now, too, uh, because of the Olympic qualifying. Adrian Heath, you came into it. And a funny story for you right here. When Orlando started here, my dad, that's Brazilian, he would want to go to all the games with me we went to plenty of games uh, especially because kaka was there too and my dad now doesn't want to go to games as much um he'll follow orlando but doesn't care as much he'll just follow to see what's going on maybe watch the playoffs but he remembers a few players from the orlando era that he went to the stadium it was like kaka obviously for obvious reasons he remembers kyle laren he talks about laren and he remembers you <laughs> believe it or not he remembers you these are the three players he still talks about too um, Breck Shea, because at the time, you were still getting called into the national team by Jurgen um, when you yeah. were with Orlando. So in terms of MLS, when you came back, you were in Europe for four years? Is that what you were there? Four years in Europe? No, no. Uh, three. Three years in Europe. Three years in Europe. How much of a jump did MLS make? Because MLS is improving every single year. Uh, that's every something year. that yeah, that like whether you like MLS or not, uh, whether you're MLS lover or hater, that is something that's not really debatable. It is improving every year, uh, whether it's blown out of proportion or underplayed, like how much it has improved. That's a different discussion. Those three years that you were gone when you came back, how much of a difference did you notice? And did it shock you how much it was improving? Uh, I mean, I can't recall specifically. Uh, details of how much it had grown at the time, but um, I mean, there was, I believe at the time, New York City and Orlando were coming in. Like you said, it was an, Orlando City's uh, inaugural year. Uh, just two new expansion teams. I, I was excited to be there. I'm excited to be back in the MLS. And it, just the, 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 the sponsorships and the teams and the, 
it's just growing. Like I said, I mean, from my first year till now, and, and next, I mean, I think next year is going to be the biggest grow, growth it's ever had. I mean, just with Messi, the impact Messi's had is is crazy, and I think it's so good for the MLS. And I talked to you earlier about it, about how I was just so happy that the Moss brothers and Beckham got him in and and actually made it happen because uh, I think it's all going forward now from here on out. Yeah, MLS, but I'm just, still it's going to grow. Them. I won't forgive them. Ever. <laughs> well, For I, well, I am pissed at them because what I, my, my dream last season was, well, I, I was hearing the Messi rumors last year, right? Everyone was hearing, right? That he would come yeah. play for a long time. I wanted to see you and Messi on the field at the same time for Inter Miami. <laughs> so I, I still hold them accountable to that. I, I just won't forgive them. Congratulations mm -hmm. for getting Messi, but I'm still rooting against Inter Miami and I'll have beef with them forever now. Well, so do my kids, so... <laughs> My there kids never wore a soccer jersey in their life, and now Messi's playing. My son wears his Miami jersey every day. I'm like, you couldn't wear that one time when I was playing? Dad, play there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now it's cool because this guy – that's how I knew how he had a big impact. When my son, who's never cared about soccer in his life, now all of a sudden cares, I'm like, all right. We have one big. thing in common. Did you know that? We have one thing in common. What is that? You know what I is? believe. Well, that, that too, but you played soccer with Kaká, and I played soccer with Kaká here at Windermere in Orlando once. Oh, yeah. So that pretty much makes us best friends now because we both we played go. soccer with Kaká here in Orlando. <laughs> we're doing a podcast. We're best friends now. And now we're best friends with that. And uh, obviously, when I played with Kaká, he wasn't trying, so that's probably the, the only thing. Well, that was the best part about him is he never looked like he was trying. When he was on, it was, he was so silky. Yeah, and that was Kaká at the end of his career, too. Imagine when I he know. had all that explosiveness in Milan. Oh, I know. And he had an injury, Kaká, that you actually had, too. Uh, you both had pubalgia, which is sports hernia in the groin. Uh, that's an injury I remember you had at some point. I don't remember when, but I remember seeing reports on that. And that's one thing Kaká had. And that injury, people say, it's nasty. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was playing for Orlando. I, I remember when it first came up, uh, actually with the national team. We were playing um, in Ajax Stadium versus uh, the Dutch, Holland. And that was right when Memphis went from Holland to, to Man United on a big money move. He was mm -hmm. playing right mid. I was playing left back, defending that guy for 75 minutes. My groin was hanging. <laughs> and I tried to play a few weeks after that, and that was, it was over. But I, I remember that. That was, it was not fun. No. Uh, I actually um... – I had sports hernia a while back, but it wasn't surgery wasn't needed because obviously I'm not a professional player, so I can just stop playing and it heals. Sometimes it comes back. And I remember that I would wake up in the morning and when I was just like the process of like getting up where you're just doing like working your abs just to get up, get out of bed, it would hurt so bad in the groin. It would be like a knife was going into it on peak pain. So I can imagine. We'll try kicking like, the ball. Oh yeah, I did. I played, and then I couldn't. I just, I just so, stopped. but I'm not a professional player, so I just said I'm out. I'm not playing. <laughs> kicking the ball was the worst. Man, it goes past. It was on my left side, yeah. So I, uh, that's when my right foot came in. And I want to ask you. I want to ask you. Uh, I guess like a lightning round um, questions. Questions with quick answers from you. And if you don't want to answer it, you say no comment. How does that okay. sound? So let's put Sounds this good. here. The best city, Miami, Orlando, or Atlanta? Cool. Uh, no comment. No com I'm going to get a lot of no comments here. Um, does pizza, does pineapple belong on pizza? It's not my favorite, but I'll, I'll do it. Okay. So I yeah. love pizza so much. I'm like a Ninja Turtle, man. I just pizza. <laughs> yeah. If you go to Hawaii, they put pineapple on almost everything. You're going to have to eat pineapple pizza. So it's not my first choice, but I'll do it. Yeah. So another one. Uh, oh, this one, this one, I already know I'm going to get no comment or maybe not. Let's see what you got on this one. Jurgen Klinsmann or Greg Berhalter? I mean, Jurgen Klinsmann. Okay. Got you. Oh, that makes I, sense. I just, I never, you know, I mean, I didn't play for Greg, so I, I don't know. I, I only know what I know. That is true. That is true. I think that's a funny one to ask also U.S. men's national team fans watching this. The the ones that followed the Klinsman era and are following the Burhalter era, who would you pick right now? Because both coaches got a lot of love from a part of the fan base and a lot of hate, even though Burhalter seems nowadays to be mostly hate. Um, I think rightfully so for a lot of reasons. Uh, let me see if there's another one. Um, are you a PS5 guy, Nintendo Switch, or Xbox guy, or neither? I don't have any of them, but I, I used to. I used to have Xbox. So I was an Xbox guy. Xbox so, guy. I'm a Nintendo yeah. guy. 
I'm an Nintendo right. Mario Pokemon. Lastly, do you want to talk mm-hmm. about the current U.S. men's national team a little bit before we wrap things up? Do you have any thoughts to share in regards to? Um, I don't know if you want to at least like the whole Burr Halter drama thing. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or even where the program is heading into 2026. Jeff Cameron had a lot to say, but you know how he is. He'll he'll say a lot, but I don't know what I played the fifth. You're not. Gonna- <laughs> I, I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> okay, Rick Shea, Rick Shea is avoiding controversy here. Um, yeah. I guess I'm gonna have to bring Jeff Cameron a year from now to talk about it again, uh, in regards to all that. But I think that wraps things up here for this interview. I hope to have you back in the future here. This was this was fun, and and I'm very happy that we actually got here in the channel. You're super chill, super fun to talk to, and I hope you're enjoying retirement now. Well, you can thank Jeff for that. So um, uh, I appreciate it. I had a blast. And I have one thing to say. I, when I would come back to play in Orlando, I got so much stick from the fans. And I just want to say that that was one of my happiest times playing in Orlando. And then Jason traded me the day before the season started. So going from Orlando to Vancouver was probably one of – that was harder move for me than going from Texas to Stoke. Just pure because I had a family at that time. I, my wife was – six months pregnant i had a kid two kids already and a puppy and then i had to pack all my stuff up and leave eight hours after finding out actually the media the media announced it before jason told me that i was being traded so my family so, found out through the media I, my, so I guess, my point was when i go to orlando and i get stick from the fans it's like yo like i had nothing to do with it i love being here it's not but, for me i went to the game that you played for inter miami i took a picture of you and put it on social media so I, it's definitely not I, for me. I, I just wanted to say it before I left. I just had to get it off my chest. So, but I'll tell you one thing too. So there's another thing we have in common. We don't like Jason Christ. And again, I'm, I'm going to say, Breck Shea didn't say anything. He doesn't like Jason Christ, <laughs> but I clearly don't. So we got that in common too. Jason Christ was also the guy that many, many years ago when Messi was in his prime said that if you put Messi in the worst team in the league, it wouldn't have an impact. Well, guess what? We put him in the worst team in the league. Inter Miami was in last. And uh, they are arguably maybe the best or one of the best teams in the league. So it did have an impact. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, but I do have people ask me like, oh, Messi is that good? Uh, yeah, he is that good. And he was doing this at the highest level, making people look silly. Like week in, week out. A year, he scored 100 goals in one season. Something crazy. But Messi came with seven other players. A whole new coaching staff, a new belief, a new confidence. You bring those players like with that, like you got Campana and Martinez and you have some good players on that team. Now they have the confidence to play with this guy. You know, like it's yes, it is messy. I'd say the messy effect, I guess. With the, I, everything I think, that came with him. Would you the, the sold out crowds and all that. That that gives the energy. You just have a different energy now. Like there's before it was kind of like mundane and you know, stagnant and and people weren't buying into it, obviously. Now it's different and there's just a different energy. I think, I guess like you can speak on behalf of this better than myself, but when you have a player like that, it, it's not just his impact on the field. He changes maybe the vibe, the atmosphere in the locker room. Everyone is like messy is there. Uh, it just changes everything. The aura, I guess that's one way to put it. Because 100%. I'll give you an example. Ronaldinho, when he went to Querétaro in Mexico, that's a team that's not known for being that great. And Mexican viewers can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's from my understanding. I don't follow yeah. Mexican soccer as closely. And they made it to the final of Liga MX, even though Ronaldinho was not playing well. But just having him there, people were talking about this, how it just changes the vibe. And then that does push. So imagine now having Messi that changes the vibe and the dude drops a goal per game. Yeah. I I, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, just the... Just like think about every player around him. It's gonna that ten percent. You're gonna run more. You're gonna try harder. You you don't want to disappoint him. You now like the team. Like there's more eyes watching. You know, like it's better for everyone. The better for the league. And uh, it's I would say it's more the messy effect that came with him. Like the the confidence, the the arrogance, the the uh, just the will and want to win for him and and to be around him. It's just I, I can't even imagine. He definitely made a lot of players around him look better. That is for sure. I agree with that. Along with him being messy, that we know how good he is himself. But Breck, thank you very much. We were going to close it and then Messi interrupted us. Yeah. That's just messy. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.